I have a constant analysis that's Braden, and Sean, and Charles, Kyle, and our process we chose was a very quick malic anhydride production. Um, malic anhydride is formed with butane and air, as this equation right here. Uh, these three are the side reactions that can occur in our catalyzed fixed bed reactor. The conditions of the reactor are set for 80% uh, conversion of butane with a 70% selectivity for malic anhydride. Uh, the malic anhydride is sold at cost to Bartex malic acid plant. So malic acid is used <laughs> the profit for the malic anhydride plant is from the <laughs> The profit from the malic anhydride plant is from the selling of malic acid. Um, malic acid is used as a food sweetener and a flavor enhancer. Uh, so as Tina was saying, we did the Bartek plant. Uh, so I'm just going to go highlight a couple features of this plant. First of all, it's outside, so it's subject to any sort of ambient conditions. Uh, and first, you have to take your liquid butane and vaporize it and mix it with air. And so that's happening in this step here, or butane being vaporized. Uh, so it, from the previous equation, you need about three times as much oxygen as you do butane in order to get the necessary conversion. And so you need a lot of air being pumped into your system. And so when we were on the plant, uh, they showed us where the compressor is, and it was a gigantic thing. Like, uh, labeled jet engine, it's pretty well to scope with that. And it uses about 3,400 kilowatts to pump in about five, fat, five million pounds of air a day. And so that's mixed with your, uh, with your vaporized butane, fed in your reactor, where it reacts using the catalyst that well, some tells me what you're talking about. And so then your product here is um, lake and hydride with unreacted constituents. And it needs to be cooled and separated downstream in order to get your pure malic anhydride. And that's done using a cyclone separator, achieving about 50 million pounds per year of 95% pure malic anhydride. So uh, for the economic analysis, it was slightly different than most economic analysis due to the fact that our plant is like producing malic anhydride to give to its sister plant. So in our case, the uh, uh, the theoretical profit we used was based on selling it at cost, and the total capital cost we did was based on the model we made rather than the actual plant PID, which was much larger. So the total capital cost ended up being approximately 16 million, with 4.5 million being the catalyst, and the annual operating cost was based on the raw materials, with 5.9 being just purchasing the butane raw material. And then with salaries of 24 operators overall and electricity costs, which were also significant, uh, approximately 1 million of the 16. Um, so the projected annual purchase cost is actually based on selling it at, or buying or selling it at market cost. So we did a projection between the like cost of buying it and manufacturing it. So overall, by having this plant, which produces malic and hydride for its sister plant, you we projected a savings of approximately 70 million compared to just buying it outright. Okay, so for our operability, we wanted to focus on some of the unique features that Bartek does, specifically on this plant. So for the operation constraints, um, there's very stringent control of the temperature on the reactor, and that's to make sure that it stays below the auto ignition point of butane. Uh, when we actually went out to the plant, one of the reactors was decommissioned, so we got to take a look and we saw over 20 redundant temperature sensors. Just kind of shows how important that is in controlling. Um, also, our input butane needs to be very pure, and also the mixture we're feeding into the reactor has to be on spec, and that's to make sure that we don't have premature fouling of the catalyst. Also, we do have an anhydrous product, so we need to make sure that all water is removed quickly so that we avoid uh, conversion into fumaric acid. Once that conversion occurs, uh, it's very difficult to reverse, so we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. In terms of flexibility and reliability, uh, Bartek has three reactors. Generally, two of them are operating at any one time. That can be adjusted depending on if we need to do maintenance or uh, the market demand as well. Uh, one of the more novel things that Bartek does is they've been able to extend the life of their catalyst. It usually lasts around four years, and with some modifications they made, they've been able to increase that up to 17 years in a row. 
And the way they do that is with a phosphate additive that they add to the catalyst that slows the oxidation. Um, in terms of some interesting units that they use, Vertec uh, uses cyclones rather than the traditional strippers. And there's a very fast throughput through these, so that reduces the chance of bottleneck. And it also gives you a very pure product. They're highly compact, so you're saving on both capital costs and space. And there's two cyclones on site, so that increases the flexibility as well. That being said, there are a lot of uh, issues with running. So specifically, the operating window for this unit is three degrees Kelvin. Okay. Now, you'd think that, that like, that's a very tight window and not very achievable in like a regular process. You'd think that there'd be more variability than three degrees Kelvin, but their operators have been so well trained and they've been with the company for so long that they're actually able to maintain this unit within that spec range. On top of that, this sort of operating window, it sort of applies to the rest of their process. They're, they look at all of their raw materials and all of their inputs and they do a very good job of managing the variation within them. Uh, specifically, uh, as we all know, with the cold day outside, the humidity in the air changes. And if, uh, because the air that, the oxygen that's being used in the reaction is just drawn straight from the atmosphere, you're gonna have different content of water in there. In order to avoid getting different colors of the product, impurities, you need to maintain that at the on-spec level. Now, whenever it's, the air is really dry in the winter, you start to see variation in your product, whereas in the summer, it's very, it, it's very humid, and you don't need to worry about the water content, water content in there. So what we would like you guys to do is take a look at the flow sheets that we've given you, and see if you can propose some ideas on how to manage the humidity in that inlet airstream. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to write them all down, and we're going to sort of evaluate them and go through them one by one, and just start shuffling them up. Open space, brainstorming, let's go. <laughs> Also, since everyone else gave out candy, we're going to give out a thing of floss. <laughs> so, the best idea is right there. Are you saying you want to add water to the team? You want to maintain humidity, yeah. You want to maintain humidity, <coughs> so. Add humidity to the actual air. It depends. If it's we said summer, you don't want to add humidity. No, that's what I said. We said summer was fine. So yeah, you have to have a lot of humidity in the summer. So, like, in like winter conditions, you actually want to add. That's right. Yep. yep. Okay. It's so dry in the winter that you don't have enough water. <coughs> Yeah, um, this is a real problem they were facing, and when we talked to them, they were saying that uh, the chief engineer was telling us he's seen like all colors of the rainbow, and like, oh my god, just due to this problem. So it's pretty big. Yeah. So I guess if it's uh, winter and your air is not humid enough, the best way would probably be to uh, warm it up a little bit, like preheat it and diffuse water vapor into it. Yep, that sounds like a great idea. What are some means that you could actually go about doing that? Uh, like heating it or? Uh, well, yeah, well, heating it, sure. It's like a heat exchanger. Is that, is that what you're saying? Like a heat exchanger? So. Is it, you have an exothermic reaction? Right? Yeah, uh, so the reaction doesn't take place until the reactor, though. Yeah, but there's available heat somewhere. So yeah, oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. you can definitely find I'm sure there's somewhere you can recycle heat. Any other suggestions? Yeah, that sort of covers both bases that Kyle was talking about, a couple zeros there. Well, what about how you determine how much to add? Any suggestions on that? Yeah, the sensing the SPF. Like what? What, a, what sort of course have we taken where we talked about humidity? Humidity. Where does that? Where do those correlations start to come from? What are? Who's the guy that came up with all that? Henry's. <laughs> there you go. Henry's and Antoine. Yeah. Are there any ideas on how you would control it? Like you have good ideas on how to fix it, but how to implement it as well. 
and how are you actually going to manage and regulate this? setup here is, is pretty classical that you've got drawn where that DPT sensors and input into it's essentially just a disturbance rejection model in a, in a feed forward control yeah. loop so you're implementing that portion of the loop and so these calculated values based on inputs goes to a calculation engine that makes a prediction on how much to open that steam valve and then you assume that your model is essentially like a model predictive controller is, is accurate yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty robust model it's a very understood and modified system Low error in the model. Yeah, exactly. It's not very complex. Any other questions? Yeah, you can raise 
Do we have the latest show up? Is there a latest show up? Okay, so good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Um, so my name is Sean. If you haven't met before, this is Mark, Talia, and West End. So we're going to talk to you about the production of dimethyl ether, which we will abbreviate to DME throughout this presentation. Uh, and we're doing that from uh, methanol. Okay, so DME is a colorless, simple, organic, or organic compound. It is used and it is used as fuel in different types of engines, and it is used in the production of sprays. And has many and has many abundant sources such as coal, natural gas, and biomass. So how do we actually make DME? So DME can be made from a two to one mole ratio of methanol. And that's a dehydration reaction, so that means there's a production of water. That's over some kind of a dehydration catalyst, obviously, like a gamma alumina. But as we mentioned previously, we can actually make this from other organic carbon sources, things like biomass, natural gas, uh, and what we do is we get syngas. So the syngas is actually used in a hydration reaction to make methanol. So we're consuming that water at the end of our methanol to DME reaction to make methanol, and then that's going to produce the methanol, which is then going to produce the DME plus carbon dioxide. So it sort of mixes together, and we can do that in one reactor with two catalysts, so that's possible. But for the purpose of our project in this presentation, we're going to concentrate on the production of DME just from methanol. So you'll see in the next slide, we're actually going to use a fresh feed of methanol process. Okay, so our process begins with a, with a fresh feed of methanol. Um, it, it is then heated and sent through a catalytic six-step rea rea re reactor. The products are then cooled twice and sent to the second, I'm sorry, and sent to the second portion of the process, which is the separation. So the separation uh, is, is quite straightforward. We're using a distillation column to separate our DME on the tops and then our methanol and water on the bottom. For the purpose of economics and for a sort of you know good sustainable operation, we're actually going to recycle the methanol. The problem is, though, if you recall from the first reaction, it's an obviously an equilibrium reaction on that catalyst. And if we put too much water in, we're actually going to force the reaction backwards, and we're not going to have any production of DME. So what we do is we use a second distillation <coughs> column to separate the methanol, or to flash the methanol, and then bring the water out. And that water is now pure enough that you can go to a, a wastewater treatment plant. <coughs> we're going to recycle the methanol back in the process, and, and everything starts again. So for the... For the safety part, we chose to focus on the first step, first step, separation step. So, what we'd like you guys to do is to help us figure out what we would need to consider when designing the safety and control system. So, we've done distillation columns mm -hmm. to death, so this should be really easy. Tell me, what do you think are some key parameters for distillation columns? Anyone, we got to be quick. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Not afraid. <coughs> Okay, Trey's not what I'm going for, so we, we, we gotta assume that we gotta assume we've got that's right though, number of trays is really important, but what we're gonna focus on here is just the the uh, we're assuming we have a fixed column, we bought one, now we have to design our control system. Feed rate. Feed rate, perfect. So uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of generalize that as just flow rate, because there's multiple flow rates. Anything else? Level feed rate? Pressure. Temperature, pressure, look at that, it's so smart. There we go. Okay, anything else? Reflux ratio. Reflux ratio. So that's uh, that's great actually. Reflux, and that's <coughs> that's going to tie back into our flow rates here. Anything else? Composition. Composition, and then right in the back. Fugacity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, but it's not going on the board. <laughs> okay, so now look at the flow sheet in front of you. Uh, the PID section in front of you. Okay, and it's right up here. Now, I'd like some ideas about where we're going to put different equipment to be able to measure and control these parameters. So it's exercise one. Any ideas? What are we going to put in there? What do we need? Anything. Yes? Valves. Valves. Okay, so where are we going to put a valve? Before the solution valve. Before the solution going to be a valve right here. Okay, so let me draw this here. So we're going to have a valve before the distillation column, okay? Where else are we going to have a valve? Tops, perfect. Where are we going to have the valve on the top? Are we going to have a valve here? No, we're going to have a valve. We 
got two valves, guys. Where are we going to put them? Yeah. Reflux. And <coughs> Re what was that, Kyle? The reflux and uh, the other side of that. On this one? Okay. <laughs> okay, now what about, uh, what about maybe on the bottoms here? What do we need here? Where do we need a valve? Okay, one here. Perfect. So one going out. But now, what about something like temperature? So you guys have focused on flurry, reflux, that's going to tie into composition. Do we need to do pressures or temperatures or yeah. something like that? Where would temperature be really key? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Like the column. The column temperature, perfect. So we're going to have a so the temperature indication on the column. We want to make sure it's not getting too hot. We need a lot of stages throughout the column so we know temperature is at Perfect. So we have temperature transmitters all here. How about in this section of the flow sheet right there? Where would we put a temperature transmitter? What would we do with it? Probably right before that valve. Right before the valve? Actually, no. What I was going to tell you is that we would put a temperature transmitter right here. <laughs> and this guy is going to feed back to a control valve letting the steam in controlling our thermal siphon reboiler. So that's a really good idea. So I want to get you guys thinking because what we're going to do is go through the entire safety development of this part of the process. So we just listed these things, temperature, pressure, composition, flow. And then the big question. OK, so as they talked about ground motors, we're now going to talk about the six safety levels, including sensor alarms and everything. OK, so, um, okay, so this is our skeleton of our flow diagram. Okay, I can't reach. But up at the top is our flare. Um, it has a pressure relief valve and a burst diaphragm. So if uh, it gets too much pressure, that's going to automatically kick in and flare out. As well as that valve is part of our SIS. So if there's too much pressure, SIS will kick in and then that will like to flare. Also, the two drains at the bottom of uh, the reflux drum and the column is if it overflows, you have to dispose that properly. So there's actually a drain, but it doesn't go to a municipal drain, it goes to use. So we um, screen 10 that is leaving the reflux drum is actually uh, spread to uh, screen 11 or 12. Most of it goes to um, screen 11, but some of it actually goes uh, recycled back to the tower. Um, so we added uh, a pump there because, of course, uh, the tower is um, around 60 feet off the ground, so we added a pump to pump it all the way up to tray number two. <coughs> Okay, so to control the temperature for uh, those um, heat exchangers, we actually added a temperature indicator connected to the stream and it's uh, connected to the uh, flow controller to the valve to connect um, how much um, heat can actually uh, be controlled from the heat exchanger. Um, okay. So you guys also talked about levels. So the level of the column has to be maintained. So we control the level with the valve at the bottom, which you guys got. And also the level at the top of the reflux drum has to be maintained and that's going to be monitored by the valve for the product. Um, our composition controller, so the composition controller is going to be on our product stream, so if that isn't what we want, we are going to increase the reflux with that valve. Um, so pressure is also a huge thing to be controlled, so we have a pressure on our pump to go back in as well as um, up the top of the first diaphragm and get set off, we have a pressure indicator so they know to replace it. And we actually just said a temperature sensor to each tray. We actually added a pressure sensor because it's more important than the temperature in this case. So we added a pressure sensor for each tray and the information gets sent back to the control room where the operator could actually see the delta P and take a decision based on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so for this one, uh, for the redundancy section, we just added a couple, um, like I added an extra pump and an extra heat exchanger, and both of them are connected uh, to two valves on either side to turn it off. It's manual uh, valves to turn it off or on um, if you want to take one offline. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, so for um, the alarms and um, uh, SIS, we actually added a lot of alarms, we'll talk about it later. Uh, we have uh, high temperature and low temperature, so if either hits, then they will actually get an alarm in the control room. Um, if the operator decides not to do anything, then um, it will hit high, high, or low, low, and then the SIS will kick in. Places where we thought they needed an alarm were the level of the column and the reflux drum, as well as the temperature entering the columns, and the pressure entering back into the column. Um, the valve 
valve there has the SAS on it, so if the SAS is to kick in, it would open up that valve and flare out so we don't, so emergency shutdown, there would be no like hand and gas in the air, we all flared. Okay, so what's next? Well, you obviously design the rest of the plant, you do your hazard, you get it going, but we don't have time for that. So, what we're going to do is have you guys do a small little exercise on this section of the plant, the reactor design of the plant. So, what we're going to do is, is look at exercise two, and I want you guys to tell me, and don't say anything because it's a competition, first six people to come up with the, the fundamentally missing control system on the flow sheet right here. We're going to rice crispy treats. So you actually adore your hand, don't talk, it's competitive, you know, push people out, like, don't push people out of the way, sorry, uh, to come down with the right answer. If you have the right answer of the one fundamentally missing thing on this reactor, you'll get a rice crispy square. There's plenty of different things, but you only get a treat if you get the one we're thinking of. So that's the game. <laughs> so it's like pick a control system behind my back and put a prize. Hey, Sean, can you just explain what E102 and R101 are again? Absolutely. So what we have here is, and this will actually give you a bit of a, a hint here, what we have here is E102 and E103, um, we'll say they're constant duty heat exchangers, okay? And E102 is another heat exchanger um, where we're able, to, we're able to use the heat from the reaction, the heats of reaction R101, to preheat the material coming into the reactor. So I've given you temperatures here. Um, Try not to give too much away. And uh, what is important is that we maintain the reactor temperature between 250 degrees C and 600 degrees Celsius. So that's really key because below that, nothing's going to happen. And above that, the catalyst starts to break down. So hopefully that's giving you a bit of a hint about what you need to control in this system. What is the thermodynamics of the reaction? It's an exothermic reaction. Okay. Yeah. Can I answer it here? Pardon me? Can I answer it here? No, you gotta come up. You gotta write it down. Come up and show me. I know, you gotta get up. It's awful. It's a good exercise. I want to treat. I want to treat. It's
So sensitivity analysis was uh, conducted on the uh, generation, steam generation unit. Uh, the main variables changed were the, uh, the company's MAR, operating cost, capital cost, and electricity. It was found that deviations in the MAR and capital cost had the most significant effect on the net present worth of the, uh, the unit. Um, when it, the uh, deviation exceeds approximately 12 to 50%, the company would actually have a negative uh, net present worth and thus not be uh, profitable. Uh, the electricity and capital and uh, operating costs had also had an effect but was not as significant as the uh, MAR and capital cost deviation. All right, so next year we have a uh, full PNID of our process. This includes all the instrument instrumentation and control systems that we design, along with some of the control systems that were already designed by uh, the company uh, on their proce or process flow diagram that they provided us. So there are some red lines. Anyways, so this, this year is our, uh, our tank, and over here is our um, once through steam generation unit. And that's the unit that we decided to focus on for our HAZOP because um, when you're producing steam, that section is where we're producing all of our steam for the plant. And if you don't have a steam with a high enough pressure or the correct temperature going into the weld, you won't pump out any of the uh, material that we're looking for. And it'll just be wasted, uh, wasted money spent on heating the water uh, through the process. So here's a blown up view of just around uh, the OTSG. So as you can see here, uh, we've got a bunch of uh, redundant valves and control loops that are installed, uh, level sensors and pressure sensors. Uh, so for our HAZOP, we decided to focus on uh, two nodes, which were the flow inlet um, into the uh, OTSG, and along with the point where the mixing was for the fuel in the air. Uh, for our case, the fuel was mixed with the air before it enters the system. Um, and that could cause uh, a large number of problems because if it's mixed improperly before it goes into the OTSG, you could just flood the, uh, flood the unit or not have enough fuel in the unit for it to even combust. So the parameters that we looked at were flow, pressure, temperature, uh, and composition. Uh, inside of those, uh, the composition was only looked at for the mixing point for the uh, fuel and the air, because at the other point, uh, we're just having uh, water come through. But we did look in case uh, some causes could be fouling or pipe leaks as well. So based off of our HAZOP of those two nodes and those parameters, we determined that these levels of safety is that have to be installed. So from the bottom towards the top, you start with your basic control systems. And those included uh, flow controls and valve controls um, to control the flow or pressure. Uh, along with, um, there was also some controls that were designed on pumps as well to control the speeds of the pumps. Uh, next, we installed alarms of high and low alarms. These were for pressure and temperature. They were installed, and level alarms as well, they were installed on the, the OTSG unit. In addition to just that unit, we realized that we do have a uh, blowdown drum at the outlet because the outlet produces uh, it mostly produces high pressure steam that we're looking for, but it also produces some byproduct that's not a high enough grade steam. So we have to flash that off separately. So we also installed a pressure and level alarm on that system as well, in case there was uh, a disturbance in the system. Uh, next was the SIS systems, and those we installed. Um, it starts off with your high and low alarms, and then it goes high, high alarms, low, low alarms. And if you exceed those, uh, we realized based off of our HAZOP that the most important thing to shut off was our fuel because if the temperature is too high in the system, the pumping the fuel in will just maintain that high temperature in the OTSG and that could cause ruptures in the pipes or impure steam that could then cause damage to the pipes in the well or going to the well. Um, so we would shut off that first and if that was not able to shut off, we do have some safety relief systems which relieve pressure in the system along with a containment vessel of a flare stack. Uh, we did look at the worst case scenario where the, there are valves and pumps coming from the fuel source. Uh, and if you were unable to turn that off, you still need that fuel to go somewhere. So we set up a bypass system with a pressure release disc. And that way it would um, send off to a flare stack if it was impossible to turn off the fuel. Okay, let's talk more about some questions around the operability of the steam generation unit. 
the first question that we got is how is the operation of site B field over the time? So after the site, the location of the facility it will be installed. We, the company has a field of they can operate over the time, and they have to decide uh, how they will increase the production of the time, making stages from the closest closest side of the unit to the farthest farthest one. And we got a worst case scenario for the steam transportation. So the steam is produced on the facility and needs to be injected on uh, the farthest wheel drive wheel drill. Uh, the, and the height difference from from the facility, and we calculate the pressure drop for this transportation to be about 18 percent of the pressure uh, produced on the the steam generation unit. And to an alternative to prevent this pressure drop would be increase the capacity of the unit by 20 percent or install pumps. Uh, in the during the pipeline to prevent this pressure drop. Other questions that we have around operability is how to identify leaking. That's the most common cause of problem in this steam generation because we are dealing with high pressures. So one alternative that we came up was the use of thermal image cameras to monitor the system and quickly identify the source of this leaking. And using the, the same kind of sensor, this company, Lone Science Technology, present this sensor that can give us an image from inside the boiler to try to identify source of falling and, and prevent the, the, lower the cost of the maintenance in the, the boiler and get a better operation of the water unit. All right, so our interactive game is going to be family feud. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with how this game works, there's going to be two different families. Uh, we're going to say the back row and these guys are on one side, and you guys can be the other family. Um, so how it's going to work is we're going to have three questions. First one to two points wins. Uh, you get two strikes, and it's a one minute limit for each question. And if you Get it. If you go over the one minute limit, the other team has a chance to steal the points from you. So, first one to two. So, um, I don't know who will say these guys go first. If you want to flip a coin, oh. All right, heads is this side. Heads! Oh. Oh. We want males. Heads. All right, you guys can go first. <laughs> we'll pass away. It's a variation on it. All right, in the economic section, there were several units. Mentioned that contributed to the capital costs. Name any of the costs. Name any of the units, sorry. Peter Stanley. Anybody know what you want? It's not about your game. There's someone else to go there, right? Causes for this problem. 
So it would be that size. And there are five possible answers. Can you read the question, please? Yep. An operator identified that the pressure of the steam is dropping. He checked the system and the feed, water, flow, and fuel are working properly. Name possible causes for this problem. There's a leak after the boiler. Fouling. Um, leakage. Leakage is what Jim said. Yeah. Leakage. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Go on. Your sensor sucks. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Five, two boys, four, and girls, three, pumps up, pumps up, broken, pumps up. At the end, give me one of those. Yes, that was a good answer, Tino. It's already on the board. All the points. The board is still. Yeah, you guys can see it. Uh, water, temperature coming in is different than the water is flowing. We didn't say the temperature. Okay, there's there's no issues with the temperature. Okay. So here's the question for both sides. There are five layers of safety discussed in the presentation today. There's also a PNID that was presented today. I'd like you to tell me one of the five, there's five answers, so there's five levels, and I'd also like you to tell me an example for the level that you're talking about from the PNID. Yeah, there's, <laughs> it was also, um, if you remember the triangle that I showed you guys? It listed all of the examples that could come up this line. So that's that first. You guys got 15 seconds to say. Basic control, feed flow rate. Pardon? Basic control, feed flow rate. Like a 